I'm really happy. I'm honored to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to start off with a poem from an, a collection I'm working on about my neighborhood called God Loves Parkdale. This is called Her Name Was Shalimar. She said her name was Shalimar. At first, I walked right past her. I had a bunch of errands to run, was grumpy and overtired on my way to the grocery store. She said her name was Shalimar. She was a sister, darker skin than me and younger and pretty. Sing on a blanket or coat or some such. At least this is what I remembered from the time I w rushed past her without a glance. This is Parkdale, I thought. If I stop to give my time and money to everyone in the hood who asks me, I'll be broke within the hour and will never get where I'm going. She said her name was Shalimar. Although I didn't know this as I pushed my buggy down aisle three, all I knew was that her face remained haunting me in the back of my brain, a memory, a refrain, like words to a song I barely remembered. Still, when I left the store, I walked past her again without a glance on my way to Dollarama, kept my head down so I wouldn't make eye contact, in and out of the store, and on my way back to the car, I was about to walk past her for the third time when something stopped me short. Maybe it was the memory of that Sunday afternoon when I was rushing off to church and one of the women from the group home called out to me from her spot on the porch and asked me for a dollar. I didn't stop that time either because I was in a rush. Had to make it to my spot on the pew, had to be there before service started so I could learn to be more charitable and kind and loving like Jesus. I didn't make eye contact with her either. I did manage to mutter, no, sorry, sis, even though I had a ton of change in my purse. But no sooner had the words left my lips than I tripped myself up. The sidewalk was clear, yet I stumbled over nothing, lurched forward and landed face down, staring at the cement, knees bloody, shin scraped, stunned, sore, humbled. The woman from the group home left her perch on the porch and ran over. She reached down and helped me up. Her eyes were lights of kindness on a face that displayed the simple-minded cognitive, cognitive sophistication of an eight-year-old. I'm a good person, she said. I like to help people. Do you have a dollar, she asked again, and this time I said yes and reached in my purse, handed over all the quarters I had saved for the laundry machine, sure that somewhere Jesus was smiling and nodding and telling me, yeah, Andrea, that's exactly what I mean. She said her name was Shalimar, not that she told me right off. She's not like me. She's not verbose and clearly had learned to filter her words. I'm sorry, I said. I walked right past you twice. It's okay, she replied as I peered down. I've gotten used to it by now. I glanced at the dingy plastic Tupperware container and the cardboard sign saying, homeless, please help. I reached in my purse. Let me see what I've got. All I've got is crappy change, I said, as I looked at the sad assemblage of nickels and dimes in my wallet, awkward silence, and then I added, I can give you a five, I can afford that much. I thought of church and the fact that I wouldn't be attending that Sunday as I'd be away in Ottawa at my cousin's big fancy wedding, just as good to give here as on the collection plate, I thought. She said thank you, and finally I looked at her properly, began, began to notice things. It wasn't the subtle traces of beard stubble under her makeup or the Adam's apple or nappy edges peeking out from beneath her wig that struck me most. It was the way she carried herself, dignified, composed, noble. Yet there were still tears in her eyes, brimming without spilling. She noticed me noticing, I'm having a bad day, she said. I reached out my hand, held hers without permission. She didn't let go, so in that moment I asked her, and she bet out her cigarette and said, My name is Shalimar. I looked at her phone, saw her name written on it in glitter, and at the time I thought it was vanity. It didn't dawn on me that it was an attempt to prevent thievery. That realization would come later, when the haze of privilege had finally cleared, but in that moment I saw the phone, the smokes, the purse, better shape than my beat-up bag, and I thought, huh. Homeless doesn't look that bad. I almost settled into that judgmental mindset when I remembered the last time I was schooled and rubbed my leg. There's a scar there now. I looked again into her eyes and softened, asked her what happened. I never thought this would happen to me, she said, never in a million years. And suddenly I could hear the voice of my own grandmother, there but for the grace of God go I, she used to say, would open her purse to anyone who asked her. I was living in a homeless shelter, Shalimar went on, pausing to look at me to make sure I understood. Those places are really, 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 really 
really terrible, she said. Someone smashed in my head with a brick while I was sleeping. There was blood all over my face. And then she said, after that, I thought there has got to be something better for me than this place. So I just kept repeating, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise. She looked me in the eye and I trembled at her faith. Then today she said, they took my dog away. He was all I had left in the world. By this time, the tears had brimmed over. I had no words. I just sat there with her on her shabby blanket, feeling stupid and useless and unworthy of my fortune. To many, I was merely fodder for pity with my meager, middle-aged, starving artist, hand-to-mouth existence. But compared to Shalimar, I was wealthy with my beater car and my feline companion of 10 years, safe and well-fed in my pretty, clean, low-rent apartment. I didn't ask what happened to her dog. Didn't push for details because I didn't have the strength to bear her response. Instead, I asked if she wanted some of my food. She took a few tangerines. Asked if I, I asked if she wanted something to drink. She said, yeah, pop. I mentioned dehydration, suggested water. Left my groceries there with her, went back in the grocery store, chastised myself for my judgmental knee-jerk maternal response and bought her both. And then I left her there. Went back to my there before the grace, pretty little crappy apartment and wondered if I had just again fallen flat on my face. I thought about Sandra Bullock in the blind side and wondered if God had wanted me to take Shalimar home to let her watch over my cat and have a roof over her head while I was away at the big fancy wedding in Ottawa. And then I thought about how naive I can be and my tendency to do the most when only a little is called for. And then I wondered what Jesus would have done if it had been him running errands that day in Parkdale. How much love is enough? How much should one person who doesn't know how to multiply fish or loaves care? I called my father in tears. He tried to do his best to deal with my wildly impractical, oversensitive, artist bleeding heart. He said, you were made this way so you could feel it all. So you'd have something that you could write about. So use the gift that you were given when you were born. I picked up a pen as I hung up the phone. She said her name was Shalimar. I wrote. Okay, I don't know if you can hear George, the spoken word cat is howling from the next room. Sorry about that. Okay, the next poem I'm going to do is um, from a soon to be released gospel album. And it begins with an African American slave spiritual called This Train. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, don't care another but the righteous and the holy. This train is bound for glory, this train. Born a slave in a West Virginian plantation, you practiced your escape daily, ran to the river over and over again, got shot twice during thwarted attempts at emancipation. You were whipped on the regular and still refused to turn a blind eye to the blatant injustice of plantation life. You refused to turn a deaf ear to the cries of your brothers, refused to allow the label slave to define your existence. They may have branded you like cattle, but they never managed to find a way to get under your skin. What spark of light ignited you to leave behind your life, your children, your wife? What inspired the desire to leave everything behind, all for the gamble that one day you'd make it all the way up north to freedom? Great, great grandfather, I wonder, did you leave the field brazenly in the full light of day, or did you wait for nightfall to cover your final departure? I wonder. How far did you get before they set the hounds loose? Did you hear them? Were you haunted by images of them tearing at your skin? Were you ever lost on that underground railroad path, wondering if you were on your own exiled adventure in the wilderness, your own 40 years of wandering, but without the gift of manna or signs and wonders to keep you going? Did you ever give up and strike some barren, unsuspecting rock in pure frustration? Were you ever tempted to circle back to the familiar chains of your enslavement? Did you ever feel that you'd been abandoned, handed over to the unrestrained sadism of Satan like some cast-out-of-the-garden, ill-fated plaything? Cursed like Job with an assortment of tortures and seemingly unending malevolent misfortune? Were you suspicious of the unfamiliar Quakers who offer food and shelter? 
Were you afraid their kindness was a trick? That it would end with you being sold back into slavery again or hanging limp from a tree like some dangling token to hatred and ignorance? Or was the faith of those Quakers a factor in your own deliverance, in your grace-fueled decision to dedicate your life to God as an impassioned emissary of the Great Commission? What led you to make that sacred covenant to cut a swath through the Red Sea of America over Lake Erie's turbulent waters, sailing towards the relative safety of northern shores? What burning bush contained the call that made you become a Baptist minister to a flock of wary, weary newcomers? Was your soul broken into submission? Or was your journey to the land of milk and honey punctuated by gifts of serendipity, blessings, benevolence, and grace? Did the face of God show himself through breathtaking ruby sunsets, through clear, crisp nights illuminated by the Shekinah glory of the North Star? Dear great-great-grandfather, I now sit here in the oblivious privilege of my relative abundance, safety, and comfort and wonder. What message did the Holy Spirit whisper to keep you moving forward? And did you ever imagine us, your progeny, your legacy, your curious descendants living up here decades later, becoming poets and parents and professors and caregivers? Did you foresee where your courage would land us, would lead us all? Here, from this vantage point of hindsight, I offer this poem as gratitude, a testament to the fugitive pilgrimage that led to my becoming what I am, a fourth-generation Black Canadian storyteller, now strong, now, now free, thriving on this true North stolen land. Thank you, and I'm sorry that the letters you had to ask someone else to write didn't deliver absolution, didn't help you find your wife. Thank you, and I forgive you for not knowing how to be a father and treating your own wounded children like chattel. Thank you, and God only knows the scars you carried over those miles, the wounds replicated in all our DNA, and the wounds that you were able to hear, heal for us all with the power of your faith. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory. Don't carry nothing but the righteous and the holy. This train is bound for glory. This train. Okay, so I have one more I want to share with you. Um, this is a very, very serious poem from my new book, A Selected History of Soul Speak, that offers a rebuttal to those literary, what I call the literary colonialists, who view spoken word and storytelling as a substandard art form. This is called Canto Unchained. This poem does not propose prescriptive approaches. It does not investigate tensions or liminal anxieties. This poem has no interest in pedagogical dialectic. It does not gesture towards paradoxical impermeability. This poem has no letters after its name. This poem came here to party. This poem makes no bones about chewing the fat, swallowing the flavors of common vernacular. This poem is bombastic and didactic. This poem has no idea what a populist lexicon is. And this poem doesn't give a sh darn. This poem has a mind of its own. This poem is a megaphone for vox populi. This poem knows what it's like to not get the joke, to read between the lines of sideways glances, head to toe once overs and dismissive deductions, the crushing ethnocentric verdict of lack of intellectual worth. This poem never joined a sorority, wasn't hip with the in crowd, knows what it's like to retire to dark corners with a flashlight and notebook. This poem laughs at its own jokes. This poem knows the sting of the whip of language, knows the echoing sound of tin cup against iron bars. This poem is learning to play the harmonica. This poem hates snobby bouncers and invite only. This poem doesn't want to order bottle service. This poem sets the velvet ropes on fire. This poem doesn't think it's a party unless everyone is there. This poem knows how to break dance, knows how to do the hustle and the jitterbug. This poem knows it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. This poem wants to give you a hug. This poem knows it has to holler to be heard over the din of corporate sponsors. This poem likes to stay up late sharing the wisdom of elders through the gift of oral culture. 
This poem knows how to keep ancient traditions warm, using breath to fan the embers of a primordial desire. This poem knows that all we all are is a spark from an inextinguishable fire. This poem is a long hair draft dodger. This poem is on a mission by any means necessary. This poem could have freed a thousand slaves from the page if only they had wanted to be free. This poem wants to be the change it wishes to see. This poem has a dream. This poem floats like a butterfly and stings like Ali. This poem always crashes the party.